Carl Kozlowski, and you are listening to the Matt Balker Podcast. Good day, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Matt Balker Podcast. It makes me feel so warm and fuzzy. Uh, please make sure you hit like, subscribe, and tell all your friends and casual acquaintances to do the same. Uh, Growing up, I was a big fan of stand-up comedy. I think that's evident in what I've been doing and also the book I wrote about Greg Giraldo called Greg Giraldo, A Comedian Story. Please purchase it on Amazon and other fine retailers. And uh, one thing I gleaned uh, from researching uh, Greg Giraldo's story was in the 90s and early 2000s, there seemed to be a pretty clear path to uh, mainstream stand-up comedy success. You would start out in either... Los Angeles, New York, or Boston, work the clubs, hopefully get a development deal, do some late night sets, and then land a sitcom and kind of you're off from there. Well, things have changed. And today's guest uh, is, is a great you know case study in that. Uh, he's a friend of mine, but more importantly, he's a reporter, editor, podcast pioneer, comedy writer, and stand-up comedian with a more Polish sounding last name than mine. Please welcome Carl Kozlowski to the program. How are you doing, Carl? Hey, okay. Clap for myself. How are you doing? Clap for Matt. Clap for <laughs> yourselves, folks. Okay. Uh, yeah, clap for, clap for everyone. I, I, it's, you know, we, we need more applause. Uh, yes. So I want to get into your recent TikTok fame. But before that, Carl, uh, what inspired you to get into stand up comedy? Um, who inspire me? And by the way, if I look away a little bit, I'm autistic uh, on a like Asperger's low level. So uh, yes, it looks weird, people, but be understanding. Um, let me think. Well, I, when I grew up, <laughs> it's kind of bad to say it now, but I loved Bill Cosby, not for the assaults, but you uh, love. Yeah, no, no, you loved his comedy. I don't, I don't think there's, you know, that that's not as controversial. You're, you're well, not in favor of of drugging and raping. I understand that. Well, what's sad is uh, that when you look up, type in Bill Cosby jokes and you just want to read his jokes, all you get are Bill Cosby prison jokes, period. Sad. <laughs> but anyway, so Bill Cosby was a favorite. Um, i trying to think who else when I was a kid, but when, uh, I loved SNL. Oh, David Letterman, my gosh. Uh, David Letterman was my hero. And uh, to this day, I, I adore him. Uh, and... Uh, I just basically discovered him. It was kind of a funny story, if I may tell you. Uh, I was in fourth grade, 1980, and he had a morning show that lasted about six months only because he was too weird <laughs> for mornings. And I, I was home one day sick, and I turned on the TV, and there's this totally bizarre show. I'm nine years old. It's blown my mind. And, uh, and so I went out of my way to fake being sick about every three weeks for the next six months till he got canceled uh, because I thought, well, my mom will believe I'm sick if, if I space it out like three weeks or so. He's sick at very regular intervals. Yeah. And because this is before v VCRs and stuff. So, uh, so anyway, so I was heartbroken when it went off the air. And then in 1982, he comes back on in late nights. I was all of 11 and I would set my alarm, an alarm clock in my room to wake up at 11.30 every night. That was the time he was on at Little Rock. And um, and I would watch the TV from like a half foot away in total, totally quiet level so I wouldn't get busted. That's probably why I wear glasses to this day. I probably <laughs> lost my eyesight. And, um, and I was like the only sixth grader who had bags under their eyes and was drinking coffee like crazy. Um, but I loved it. And then when S I discovered SNL, right after Eddie Murphy left, unfortunately, but the year where they had Billy Crystal and all these, Martin Short and all these superstars were on for a year. And I just fell in love with those two things. And that's all I ever wanted to do. And I'd say as an adult who really inspired me uh, when I was starting out in the 90s was uh, Chris Rock. Uh, I now am writing stuff that is a little bit in that vein. Um, I never have until recently. I'm writing a lot of Seinfeld societal observation kind of jokes um but i saw i saw bring the pain his first special on hbo chris rocks and 
I was just so floored. I've never seen anything so funny in my life to this day. And I oh, it, it, I, it holds up remarkably well. I mean, even if you know the jokes, it's still hilarious, like 20 oh, plus yeah. years I later. Mean, and, and, I, and, and, but the thing was, I taped it, you know, it was still as VCR days, <laughs> and I taped it, and I watched good chunks. I think I watched the whole thing over like three times in one night. I just could not stop laughing. I was mesmerized. And so, you know, so I'd say he's my favorite all-time comedian, uh, you know. So, yeah, that's how it all got going. Well, he, he's, he's a good choice. So, Carl, you and I met in Los Angeles doing you know, various shows. Uh, and uh, you, you mentioned uh, re- recently that you had a hard time getting to shows because while well, a lot of us were driving cars, you would have to rely on buses. Can you share with us why? <laughs> well... Okay, so I said I had narcolepsy on stage because it was, for some reason, narcolepsy sounds funny to people. That's a disease you fall asleep anytime, anywhere. (laughs) But um, it was really, it turns out, I I cured it, cured myself of it after almost 20 years uh, when I moved back to Little Rock, my hometown, about two years ago. Turns out it was actually, I'll get to the bus in a second, but it was actually a combination of I had bad diabetes and was just falling into carb comas after eating. And also, um, I had sleep apnea that wasn't being properly treated. So the combination of those two things would just knock me out all the time, as if I were narcoleptic. And so I, I crashed my car uh, six months after moving to L.A. in 2003. Uh-huh. And um, so I had to ride the bus because I, I was afraid to ever drive again for you know, the whole time I was there, it was another uh, 16 years I didn't drive. And then all of 2020, I didn't drive either. Uh, so we'll get to how I started again in a second. But riding the bus everywhere uh, was like totally bizarre in a city that is famous for being the car capital of the world. And when people ask me what it's like being narcoleptic, I would tell them that every time I woke up on a bus, 10 stops past where I meant to get off, I'd feel like I drugged, kidnapped, and abandoned myself. And I'd be <laughs> staggering around the bus confused like Dorothy at the end of The Wizard of Oz. Like, wait, Cindy the Crackhorn, you were there. And, oh, Methad Tony, you were there too. Yeah, uh, Methad so, Tony is uh, good people. Yeah, he's very popular in L.A. Yeah. So... You know, um, but basically, yeah, I got over this because I moved home uh, to be near my folks, and uh, my mom gave me good cooking. I could come over for dinner anytime I wanted, and so I was eating better, and also I got a new uh, CPAP machine, so that helped with sleep apnea, but uh, I finally convinced my terrified dad. Uh, I say I drive like an 83-year-old man because I was taught by my dad, an 83-year-old man, how to drive again, <laughs> and he took me. Uh, to his the cemetery he's going to be buried in, and oh, uh, had me drive around on the little roads there first. And I figured that he just figured that I could drive safely there in a cemetery because if I if I hit anybody, they'd be dead already. That so, that's a smarter bet. Yeah, you have less yeah, legal and liability. Could also slide his body directly into his mausoleum spot if anything went wrong. <laughs> what a practical father. That's impressive. Yes, practical, yes. So what motivated you to leave Los Angeles to return to Little Rock, Arkansas? Um, Okay, well, (laughs) as they say, it's getting real. Uh, I'll just be honest with it because I um, have been pretty open on Facebook and stuff, So, and I think it helps people to hear things like this. Um, I never knew that I was bipolar, amazingly, uh, my entire life until... I came home uh, in January 2020, and I knew that I had a tendency to have great, you know, feats of productivity and great ideas, <laughs> and they would and they would really blow up and be really good things. Uh, but I would always have a hard time sticking with it, or uh, you know, really bringing it over the finish line. Uh, and also, I had long periods where. I would be depressed that I couldn't figure out why. And I was going to shrinks and nobody ever brought up, hey, I think you're manic depressive. Um, but I had a big crash after losing 
I had a 17 year job as an arts editor at Pasadena Weekly newspaper. We got bought out in August of 2019. I got laid off a month later. And then I had a radio show producing and hosting job uh, on KRLA radio. And that ended at the end of November. I just kind of uh, spiraled after that and was just completely depressed, unable to do anything. And uh, I, uh, I hate to say it, but I checked myself into uh, like an emergency room and I wasn't like really suicidal, but I didn't know what else to do. I just was basically frozen with anxiety and all sorts of depression. And um, I wound up being bounced around. This is pretty crazy. I wound up being bounced around to four facilities in 11 days before I finally agreed to come home. My folks kept saying, just get out of there. We'll bring you home. And I don't know, I was just so thinking so badly at the time that I didn't take them up on the offer until like the 10th or 11th day, which was really stupid, but anyway. And um, so I came home and I lived with my folks uh, for the first like 15 months uh, because they were, you know, we didn't know how bad was it? Would it ever happen again? Was this a hopeless situation? Um, but then thankfully, with, with great uh, therapists and uh, proper meds and being diagnosed finally, um, it, everything went much better and I wound up moving out on my own again. So, uh, Sorry, I yeah. want to pause briefly, Carl. Uh, can you share with us, like, what, how does one get diagnosed with bipolar? And, and for people out there who are unfamiliar, can you share, like, how it's different from someone just feeling a little up and down. I mean, it's obviously a clinical condition, so I'd love to learn more about it. Okay. Well, um, I got diagnosed. Well, what happened was when I went into the uh, psych ward in uh, LA, uh, you know, it was, if you ever seen one flew over the cuckoo's nest, <laughs> uh, mine was It's like been a while, but yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Nest. You know, I was living the sequel. <laughs> um, because I was much more sane than everybody else around me. Like everybody else was like, you know, yelling at each other. I'm Jesus. I'm the devil. Like they get into arguments and, or this one guy would just scream at all hours of the day and night. I need preparation H. My ass is on fire. <laughs> and, and, you know, just amazing. And so I had to like, uh, and, and I had my wits about me. I just was paralyzed with anxiety and so I'm, I'm imagine barely able to do anything, but having to hear and understand what's going on with all these people who are even far more out of their minds than I am. Uh, but <laughs> while I was there, they labeled everybody as paranoid schizophrenic because I think it was just an easier way because pretty much the rest were. Uh -huh. uh, and they just labeled me the same way because I think it was just easier to process than to really evaluate me. Um, so I came back to Little Rock with this horrible diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, but thank God these therapists I went to, uh, they reevaluated me and they said, no, you're not schizophrenic. You have to like actively hear voices to be labeled schizophrenic. And uh, I wasn't paranoid. I was just, you know, scared of where my life was going, but I wasn't like imagining the government was after me or anything. Uh, so I don't know. It just was being in therapy answering a bunch of questions because they knew something was seriously wrong that put me in the hospital. So they put me through a very detailed uh, discussion of my life and breaking it down and evaluating, uh, you know, what they thought it could be. And they said that when they heard that we went through long periods of upbeat and getting, you know, insane amounts of things done and the long periods, like months at a time of being depressed, they said, yeah, you got serious bipolar, but they labeled me, What's known as bipolar two, because bipolar one is where you're really out of control and you're violent and could be dangerous to society. Not always, but that's that's the higher level of uh, considered out of control usually. Mm -hmm. And I'm like bipolar two, where you have big periods of ups and downs, but you're not like you know out to hurt anybody as a result. Like and by the way, if anybody's watched Ozark. Um, Season three, I believe, uh, is when uh, Laura Linney's brother, who's bipolar, comes on the show. Not only is it like an amazing performance that I thought should have won an Emmy, but um, 
it, it, that's what bipolar one is like, where you know you can be a sweetheart at heart, but mm-hmm. you just can't control your violent impulses or bad decision making. And the poor guy, you know, screwed up over and over on the show. Well, that that's helpful. So when you got this diagnosis, Carl, what was your reaction? I mean, I was I was relieved to know that there was an answer for this stuff. I also felt bad because, in a way, because uh, 20 years before, I had a very serious girlfriend, and she went into a very uh, black period of depression, like seeing black, she said. And she eventually got diagnosed as bipolar, I think, one, because she has had problems with you know, criminal encounters and things like that. Um, and, uh, and, somebody, and a doctor told us, we were, we were thinking of getting married, and the doctor said, you know, it's, if you're not already married, it's best to just give up on these situations when it's bipolar one, because there's really no cure, and it's going to just be a ton of hardship over the years, you know? So, um, so we broke up mutually, but when I realized, oh my gosh, I'm bipolar, I did feel really bad about that, and I and I called her, and you know said, "Man, I almost understand what you been, what you went through." And, you know, sorry about all that, but you know, uh, so it was it was a, kind of an awakening that, you know, this is really something that you might think, "Oh, why is somebody acting so weird, or why can't they control themselves?" But you know, it's something you really. Um, if you're if you're not treating yourself properly, then uh, it really you know is a problem that you can't control. Mm-hmm. So you you, met, you mentioned you got you felt some relief uh, yeah, after your diagnosis. You reached out to an ex girlfriend, and then uh, you you got a job that kind of helped recultivate your love for comedy. Can you <laughs> share with us what that what that was? Very untraditional yeah, was comedic path, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Part, big part of why I went depressed and crashed in LA was that when I worked at the newspaper, a weekly paper for 17 years, um, I was able to delegate almost everything, but choosing what stories, doing interviews and writing the stories. Um, other people had all the technical stuff. And so that left me a dinosaur in the news industry for any substantive jobs. And it's all I had done ever, 25 years. So I thought, oh, I'm screwed. I'll never get another job again. And um, the first year or so back in Arkansas, I should have been looking for work, but my family was like, you know, a little too, uh, not their fault. I mean, it just was, it is what it was, but they were so concerned about what had happened to me that they didn't put any uh, pressure on me to get a job. I, it kind of was just adrift with things you know and did some freelance writing that was it uh but then my dad tells me once he taught me how to drive and i had uh his car that he kindly gave me um he said well why don't you look for a job you know like get out there you know even if it's walmart uh just to get your foot in the door somewhere and be around people and all that and uh you know that the longer i went without a job the worse it would look on my resume whenever i wanted to really look and so I thought, Walmart. And I hated Walmart when I was growing up. <laughs> like, I, I took pride because it was it, it represented Arkansas, which I hated growing up, though I love it now. Um, and uh, I love Walmart now. I'm just saying that for my job. But, but basically, uh, I always took pride that I never set foot in a Walmart or at least spent money in a Walmart my entire adult life. Because in Chicago and L.A., there are no Walmarts uh, in anywhere close to the city. They're all in the distant suburbs for some reason. And so I was like, yes, I don't ever have to shop there. But I applied, and it was a surprisingly hard test. I was surprised. I mean, there was a lot of trick questions for finding a character and your judgment and things like that. Um, and I was lucky. I had a friend who worked at Walmart, so I just kept pausing my home test and calling her going, I think I should say this, right? And so she guided me through it, which sounds pathetic. But I, I, the thing was, I put it on my resume. I also was afraid to list anything about comedy uh, on my resume because I thought people would say, you know, you're 
not serious than about a job or you're right. just going to clown around, you know? And so I have not, I have taken off this huge part of my life that I take, should take pride in. I played uh, for money clubs like the Laugh Factory, Zany Chicago, the uh, Comedy Store, the Ice House. Uh, you know, I never got TV famous, but I was in all these great places. And, uh, you know, and, and here I was like trying to hide it. And, uh, and also hiding my celebrity interviews that I did as an arts editor. So somebody convinced me right as I was about to apply to Walmart, put all, just put all that stuff back on. It's me. Don't hide it, you know? And so I listed one celebrity, Kevin Costner. That was my best interview ever, biggest interview ever. And I, put, I sent the resume in with all my comedy experience, along with my regular job stuff, of course. And I get personally called by the head manager of the Walmart, which like never happens. You get called in by an <laughs> HR guy and they're shuffled through with a bunch of people and just do one interview after another. They barely talk to you and you're in because it's Walmart, you know? And the manager called me in and said, I want to meet you myself. And I was like, okay. So I show up and the first thing he asked me was, so tell me about meeting Kevin Costner. <laughs> and I was like, what? He goes, I don't, he goes, I don't care about anything else. I just wanted to meet the guy who met Kevin Costner. I love Kevin Costner. Is he really so good at baseball? They had a funny story about Kevin Costner, and that got him rolling. And then he kept asking me, tell me about this. Tell me about that. Oh, my God, you do stand-up comedy. So I did a half hour with the guy uh, all about comedy and meeting Kevin Costner. We, and he never asked me one thing about work and <laughs> like, I'm just trying to work the register guy. What, what do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, he hired me and said, hey, registers, uh, cashiers are the people with personality. I'm hiring you. And uh, so I wound up thinking what I thought would be such a lame job. It was like doing crowd work, you know, and, and interacting with audiences eight hours a day every day. It still is. So I'm dealing with 100 to 200 people a day. And I'm learning to ask them questions on the fly about themselves or make little wisecracks and stuff. And that was something I was always weak at. Yeah, how before. did that go over? Because I could see some people enjoying it and others like, I'm just here to purchase some bounty quicker picker uppers, funny guy, like move it along. Like Most what, people what? like it, but then, yeah, there are people who just kind of scowl, you know, or <laughs> just gruffly go, uh-huh, you know, you know, but uh yeah, most people are cool with it, and uh, and they they and they say they tell the managers, you know, wow, that guy really is funny, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but what really happened that was crazy was uh, my dream. <laughs> one of my bucket list wishes was to commandeer a bullhorn in a public place and say outrageous things because that was my favorite thing David Letterman would do on his show in the eighties. <laughs> He would get on a bullhorn, lean out of a high-rise window or in a car passing by and or yell out horrible things to make people think of they were, that it was authorities warning them about something. And it was hilarious. So I wanted to do that my whole life and never had a chance. And so here I am. We have a loudspeaker system. There's people doing boring announcements, telling people to close the store uh, like five times a night between 1030 and 11. And uh, and I kept asking, can I do the announcements? And they kept saying, no, no, that's a supervisor's job. But one day all the supervisors were gone. And I just grabbed the phone and I started, I did things like people of earth, the time is now 1030. You have 30 minutes left to shop. My God, what are you going to do? You know, that kind of thing. And, um, and everybody was laughing, the, the, the staff, the, the customers, et cetera. Or I'd be like, sir. You in aisle 12. I didn't even know if there's somebody in aisle 12, but I'd be like, put that down. That's not good for you. You don't need it. You know, that kind of thing. And uh, so the p person in charge that night was just a higher up regular employee. They said, oh, my God, you have to do this for the managers tomorrow. So I did it again the next night with, like, three managers watching, and they just exploded laughing. Like, I thought I'm going to be in trouble. And so the head guy who... Uh, hired me because of comedy he was like this is part of your job just don't swear you can do whatever you want five times a night five days a week like i don't care this is part of your job it's great and like a couple months in a boss uh, another boss said well uh why don't you put these on tiktok and i knew nothing about tiktok 
I'm 50. I'm not very tech savvy. I barely know how to use Instagram. And so I didn't know what the deal was. Like it's and, just for hashtag dances. That's that's what I yeah. understand it is. Yeah. But it's like YouTube in a minute or less, although you really feel like two minutes. Mm -hmm. And so she showed me, she goes, my 11 year old son is a moron and he has like 150,000 followers. And I was like, really? Just for playing video games and showing off. And so she showed me how to do it. And I'd say, uh, so I put up hundreds of these videos. I occasionally mixed it up with um, going to a super center down the street and doing outrageous stunts, like having cart races, uh, pulling wheelies in the middle of the floor. Uh, I, I did a, like a lightsaber battle using uh, pool noodles one time, and we put the Star Wars theme and lightsaber effects over it and put that up. And, um, and I was growing an audience, but I really had about 650 followers, and I had like a couple hundred to a thousand people watch a video every day, which is okay, but not great. And then somehow, three weeks ago, tomorrow, uh, like in a world taping, so, uh, but on a Wednesday night, uh, late, mid to late uh, May, uh, there was, uh, I decided, why don't I try one of my actual comedy bits and see how it flies on the internet? Mm -hmm. So I told a story about how Bill Clinton served me popcorn, or I, mean, I served Bill Clinton popcorn, sorry. When I was in high school, well, you said Bill Clinton what? if you said it to a woman, it would sound like sexual harassment. Oh. And so I, I told the story, and you could hear laughing throughout the store in the background. And then I posted it with the title, I was sexually harassed by Bill Clinton with three exclamation points. And I put <laughs> it up, and it has exploded. I crossed 750,000 views yesterday. Um, I now like people are jumping on being followers. I've, I've, I've 8,500 followers in just like two and a half weeks after being at 650 forever, and I have 150,000 likes, and it's crazy, you know. And I, I called a producer friend yesterday who works with America's Funniest Home Videos. He wants to get me on with one of the videos, and there's another show they're developing with comedians. Uh, doing crazy things and he's going to try and get me on that also so it's weird i'm 50 i'd pretty much given up on comedy and now this job at walmart you know open the door <laughs> hear that kids work stuff stop trying to become a comedy store regular and get a job at the register in the bentonville arkansas yeah. in a little rock arkansas yeah, yeah. Uh, so so you you be, become you know TikTok famous for um, a Bill Clinton bit. And how did that propel the next phase of your comedy journey? Uh, how would this, well, if I could get on. Uh, you know. Well, you <laughs> mentioned these shows, but are, are, did, you, you then, you took your act outside of Walmart too, right? You, you started performing at local clubs. Oh yeah. Yeah. I started. Um, okay. So uh, that gave me confidence to uh, perform again. Cause I've been, like going, I had not been performing much in LA uh, the last year or two that I was there, uh, you know. And I, so I, I asked the comedy club in Little Rock called the Looney Bin, uh, which is ironically named because I joke now that I'm the only comic to make it from the Looney Bin to the Looney Bin in less than three <laughs> months. But uh, I think there's got to be others. But you're, you're, you're maybe you're the trendsetter. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, yeah, I asked the manager, could I audition? And so he put me through a couple of auditions at shows performing. And then he booked me. I went up in October for a week. And he liked me enough to tell me, call him every three months as an MC. And if I did a second week as good as the first one, uh, then he would move me up to feature act in the middle. And he would get me booked at their sister clubs in Oklahoma City, Wichita, and Tulsa. And I was supposed to called him in January and get that rolling, but I did hit another depressive episode um, for a couple of months starting in January, and I never thought to call. And then right as I snapped out of it in uh, Easter week, um, he wrote me and said, where the hell are you? You never called me. And I was like, oh, hey, okay, well, I was, he goes, I read your Facebook. I know you're a mess. And so he says, <laughs> um, you know, he goes, just get your butt down here. And so I showed up that night, he threw me on stage, 
and he liked what I did, and so he booked me for July 6 through 9, and so this will be the one that decides if I move up and if I get booked in other cities. Nice. Well, I, I hope everyone checks out Carl at the Looney Bin, July 6 through 9. At the Looney Bin in Little Rock, folks, if you're in Little Rock area. Well, I, I, even if you're not, book your tickets yeah, now and go to the Little Rock area, damn it. Yeah. So you went back to Arkansas. You learned all this about yourself. And you, you mentioned you kind of had a, a little bit of a, a spiritual reckoning, too. Can you share with us what yeah. you meant by uh, that? Yeah, no, I was raised Catholic, and um, but I like gone through. I was kind of wishy washy. I went through periods where I just barely, you know, cared about going to church at, on Sunday, and um, you know, didn't really like. Sometimes I was really on fire for a while and enthused and praying all the time. And sometimes I'd go through these long phases, kind of like manic depression. You know, I never tied to that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, where I would barely pray and, you know, would just drag myself through the door on a Sunday and whatever. But then uh, what happened this time is uh, I hit another depressive episode January through uh, until Easter week. And I really hate to admit this, but I went to the hospital again for three days in February. I checked myself in. It was it was really bad. I don't I don't really know. I, well, I, I can say I don't want to like be over the top about this, but it's reality. Basically, I had a, I host a, a radio show that we filmed like a Zoom cast and then put it on radio in Little Rock. And um, there were three Sundays in a row where the only time we could get our guest was on a Sunday morning. So I missed church three weeks in a row, and so whatever depression I had, I think was made worse by being totally spiritually unconnected, um, which I don't know, that's honestly what I feel happened. It made it vastly worse. And um, and so when I uh, when I finally, like I got to the hospital in February, and I was still quiet and, and riddled with anxiety afterwards and wasn't talking to hardly anybody for, <clears throat> you know, another almost two months, seven weeks, something like that. And... I finally opened up to my shrink who's at a Christian therapy place and, you know, decided, well, I'm just going to tell the truth for once and let him know all the things that were, you know, getting, getting me buggy and anxious and all that. And I did have a long list of things that were, that were of concern to me, but I was blowing them out of proportion in my head. And so I talked it out and he said, oh my gosh, you can solve this by doing this, solve this by doing that. He gave me a list of things that indeed within three or four days I solved all my problems by just facing them, calling the places or people and talking with them and, and working things out. But um, he also encouraged me to, uh, uh, I called another priest friend of mine that I've known for 20 years and he said, you need to go to confession and find a young priest that will understand you and go to confession. So I went face to face with a young guy priest at my parents' church, and he let me talk for forty minutes with him. And <laughs> there's, a, there's like a line outside the confessional. You're like, no, I've got this booked for a while. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's like um, I look at confessions kind of like honestly, it's like therapy. Only it doesn't cost you anything, and you know, and you, but you get, have to do penance afterwards. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But you get, uh, you know, but you get a, a genuine sense of forgiveness. There's a concrete, you know, you sure. walk out of therapy, even with a Christian one, and it's like, okay, I mean, you can trust. <laughs> you get a ninety dollar bill, you. yeah. Now you just yeah. have to do ten hail marys, and and you're good. Yeah, exactly. But but he but the, he told me the 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 shrink said I should find a way to immerse myself in prayer, and uh, and I said, well, you know, Catholics have daily mass available. And so I, t I told that to the young priest, I said, I'm thinking I'll go to daily mass because I work at night, so it's easy for me to get there in the morning at 8.15. So um, so I started going on a Holy Thursday, and I haven't missed it since. And all this stuff happened since then. I got uh, I have an offer for a much better job, I don't want to jinx it, where I make double the money, although I'll still... 
um, probably stay at Walmart two nights a week just so I can keep this, you know, this comedy thing going. <laughs> you got to work out material somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also, you know, I have no TikTok. Uh, people don't care if I'm not actually barking it into a public loudspeaker. You know? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I got this incredible uh, job I heard about. I went through five rounds of uh, applying and, and interviews, and I found out Friday, but I think I got it. And then um, this TikTok thing blew up for the first time right after I, I started going to church every day. And uh, there's been a couple other things that have been really big. And uh, I got a ton more work from my magazines that I write with. Uh, like I'm on contract now to get X amount of money every month, which is great. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm not saying everybody's got to go to church every day. I, I do encourage people to find a way to pray to, uh, I see it as a, as a Judeo-Christian God, but whatever you know, I, I respect the AA and the higher power thing. So whatever your belief is that makes you feel spiritually connected to to pray as like every day if you can. And uh, and it, by the way, before I sound like a lunatic going to church every day, uh, Ray Romano and Kevin James are best friends. And whenever they're in LA, they go at 6.30 every day at a church. I won't say where, but I know about it. And Mark uh, Wahlberg does too. So take that. Yeah, Mark Wahlberg, you were telling me he even goes multiple times a day on Sundays, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's crazy. Well, I'm here, I'm saying that's crazy, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I just go once a day every day, but he goes multiple times. and He goes multiple times every day? Well, I, I don't know. I know he has gone multiple times in, in a day. Um, that's just because I have a monitor on him. And... I know that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I know you're, you, you mentioned uh, Ray Romano and Kevin James. Yeah, what about you said you said you kind of looked up to the they they were they were two comedians who go to church every day. So for people out there who are like, you know, well, I'm just saying, look how successful they are. You know, it's kind of a principle I realized that if you put God first, then uh, God will put you first. You know, and I, I hope I think that you know it's important because it's not just here. You know, hopefully in the afterlife too. It's not it's not just about getting you sure, know booked at comedy clubs. It's you know, there's a yeah, hopefully a lot more time we have after, uh, you know, we end our stay on this planet. Um, well, this has been, uh, you're, you're, you're very, uh, you know, I've known you for a while, but you, you seem like you're in the best place you have been in, uh, in decades. And yeah, I'm really, definitely. I'm really proud of you. Very, very impressed. Thank um, you. What are you doing? You, know, you mentioned going to church, but you know, I, mean, I guess what, what advice can you give for people who, maybe have bipolar disorder, maybe they don't, maybe they have Asperger's, maybe they don't, maybe they're just kind of struggling to find their way. Um, what would you tell those people? Um, I mean, if you can, not everybody has the ability to get evaluated, but you'd be surprised there are, um, like there's usually, at least in big cities, some sort of program out there if you do the research that you can go get seen uh, by at least a student psychiatrist, psychologist, you know, kind of like, kind of like going to uh, barber college for a cheap haircut, but they'll see you. And I imagine they're still pretty good. Uh, but they'll see you uh, for very low cost or no cost, I've heard. Um, at you know, if you, if you look up, uh, just look up, you know, free or low cost psychiatric services in or counseling in whatever town you're in. Uh, because I do think it makes a lot of difference to get evaluated on, um, uh, you know, there's no point in just going through life confused and de depressed about what you're dealing with. And as far as Asperger's goes, um, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky that it manifests itself mostly in the I thing, you know, mm -hmm. like having to shut my eyes a lot. But um you know, otherwise, I don't think I have a lot of weird quirks, but uh, my brother has some more pronounced problems with autism, but he's super high functioning and he's uh, vice president of Arkansas Council on Disabilities, like a state physician, you know, and uh, and he, he is the one who said, you have Asperger's, I know you do, and he kept insisting until he got evaluated. So, you know, there are more pronounced uh, signs out there, you know, and 
I think he would just say, you know, try to get uh, a good counselor and talk it through with them also, you know. That's good advice. And for people out there, Carl, who want to see your comedy or learn more about you, where can we direct them? Um, okay, I have a website I'm about to try and improve, but it's pretty good. Uh, uh, CarlCauseKOZ.com has links to uh, my funnier journalism stories. I did a lot of comedic journalism as well. And uh, it has a link to my sitcom pilot. It's only 15 minutes, so it's easy to watch. I would love to see people watch it and see what they think. Um, it has uh, a link to my stand-up under the Ice House logo, Ice House Comedy Club logo at the bottom. Uh, and uh, it's a really good set. It's not what I'm doing now. I've lost a lot of weight. And I'm doing very, I'm doing much more stuff about life and society, not just my stuff then was like Rodney Dangerfield, very self deprecating. Uh, and so you can find all that at crawlcause.com. And then what I'm really proud of is I had two really good radio shows, uh, one in LA called, in LA called uh, Man Up. And so you can find it at manupshow.net. We have almost 40 episodes with some really major guests, and it's a well designed site. I think anybody would love it. And then uh, we did about 15 episodes of a show called uh, uh, Dream Up in uh, Little Rock Radio, and it's dreamupshow.com. So manupshow.net and dreamupshow.com. And uh, yeah, and my podcast, I ran a company for years called Radio Titans, and you can find some things. Uh, at radiotitans.com. Thank you, Carl. We'll, we'll link to uh, those sites, and uh, we appreciate you appearing on the Matt Balaker podcast. Thank you, Carl. Sure, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it.